um, hearing what James has got to share with us today. So James, come up. I'm going to pray for you, and then we will um, pass over to you. So yeah, Father God, we just pray for this um, man of you. Um, thank you for his spirit and for his heart. Um, and God, this word that has been developing and dwelling in him for so long, we just pray today, God, that the words that he speaks will speak directly into our hearts, into our spirit this morning. Um, coming from you, Father God, pray that the challenge and the acceptance as part of this word is felt deeply in us today, that we can take into um the rest of the day, the rest of this week, to chew on and mull over. Thank you, God. Amen. It's the my pub. Um, <laughs> James Dwee, at Wim Wim Schlandonne, or a trifle on a moor. Evotoili, old Nurag. <laughs> Good luck. Um, I live, uh, my name is James. Uh, I live on the beach at Land on, Land on the Beach. I don't know if anyone's been there. It's quite near where Steve and Meg live. Uh, they live in the village. And uh, Barry and Kate also live in the Land on the village. And James, <laughs> sorry, James. <laughs> uh, James also, uh, it's great. Um, but we live, we're very blessed to live right on the beach itself. And the cooling breeze has been an absolute, literal, literally a godsend on that beach we have a little baby staying with us our third grandson and he was he was he, they, he was born in manchester they they said my daughter phoned up on friday night saying can we come down dad the, the flat is it's, it's stifling it's 30, 32 degrees and said sure come down it's nice and breezy by the beach and so come down <laughs> and uh, have a bit of time with us which is great so yeah we've lived we've lived on uh, anismon on anglesey for 12 years permanently and um, the family have had a, had a place at Landona, tri uh since about 1953. But Leslie and I, we moved there. Um, and I'll mention a little bit later why we moved there in the sense of calling to, to the beach and to Landona a little bit later on. And the, the importance, the significance of the beach. Um, today we're talking very much about connecting with God through nature. And it's a, it's a beautiful place to be. And it's a beautiful island. It's a, it's a fantastic place to be. Just in terms of background, before I carry on, um, I was I started my, my, my career uh, in me in medicine, in medical pathology. I did a degree at at Leeds University and trained as a pathologist uh, in bacteriology. Um, the tool of my trade was a microscope, <laughs> so we're well, at least looking down these things. Uh, the sheer beauty and intricacy of of the of the creation, absolutely stunning, beautiful. But then as, as God often does, I didn't stay in pathology. He called me into being a primary school teacher. <laughs> and so that's what I've been for most of my life. I'm retired now, sort of. I do a bit of tutoring every now and again. But um, I'm actually 35 years old. Um, I'm the same age as John Sadler, don't know where John's gone. Oh, he's got a <laughs> John's gone upstairs, but we're actually the same age. We've got the same birthday, actually. We're the same age. We're both 35 years old. I just look 60 because I was a teacher. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, it's been a privilege and an honour to work with children most of my life. It must be the child, child in me that relates somehow to the little ones. I was a primary school teacher. You know, people are thinking that I'd go into secondary education, doing biology and chemistry, but I didn't. Uh, we kind of got involved in a youth club at our church and we, we kind of related, both Leslie and I, to working with kids and the rest is history. So, um, today, if you'll have a like to have a look at the screen, uh, this was a talk, as, as Al said, prepared in a series on sustainability, but for one reason or not, uh, it was delayed. So anyway, I've had to change it quite a bit because it, it fitted in with that, that series, but this is really um, a bit more reflective, a bit more kind of to do with my own journey and this kind of theme in August of sharing stories. So I'll share a few stories of how I've connected with God through nature. Um, so we're going to be looking a little bit about how, how and why we can do this. Um, we're going to be learning 
a little bit from our Christian forebears. A lot of people who know me know my love of history, and the, uh, certainly Christian history uh, in, in Wales and Anismon, uh, the Celtic period, as it's called, 5th to 7th centuries, and the expansion of Christianity here, very significant. Um, talk a little bit about <laughs> what it means, the Celtic church, but that's, it's, it's only in passing really that. And really, t- right toward the end, really a personal response and um, about our how we react as Christians to the great creation and a bit about stewardship. That's what we're going to be doing this morning. You hear a lot these days, don't you, of phrases like well-being. You hear a lot about rewilding. You hear a lot about connectedness. Um, There's an organization in Bumaris based in the east side of Anglesey called Coulomb Serial. In English, it means the serial. It's not serial. was a guy who was based at Penman, a Christian guy who was based at at Penman years ago, centuries ago. And this organization helps people to reconnect with nature. They're not a Christian group. But it's interesting that what they're developing now is a sense of uh, they're asking people to come forward to and they take people on walks through woods and forests and stuff and so that people reconnect. Often troubled people who just kind of want to find a little bit of peace, uh, whatever they're looking for, really. I think increasingly people are reconnecting with nature. That, that's banded around a lot these days. But what are people looking for? Are they looking for healing? Are they looking to be healthier? What's about, what's our purpose? Are they connecting, are we connecting with our own history, our own roots? Are we reconnecting with our ancestry? Are we reconnecting with tradition, culture? Uh, that's ultimately rooted, I think, very historically, it's certainly on, in Wales, you know, with our, the, this idea of place and our rootedness to a particular place. Read some very familiar words to you from John's Gospel, the first few verses. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. I love the story of the creation, Genesis 1 and 2. I love that repeating phrase, and God saw that it was good. We live in a beautiful world, but that is not the limit. As we've been praying before, we live in a vast creation. We are tiny. We are very small. And we'll discuss a little bit later on about how we fit into all that. Obviously, as Christians, we believe in a creator. Genesis, for me, is not so much about how or when, but why. Why did God create? It seems clear throughout Scripture, and not just Genesis chapter 1, that God created all things for relationship, essentially, to be in relationship with. He didn't just create human beings. Uh, We need, first of all, to reflect a little bit on our place in the created order. As I said before, we're a tiny part of it. As I said before, uh, I was a microbiologist. I spent (laughs) most of my time using microscopes of various sizes and shapes. People have often questioned me about, well, what's this kind of Christian science interface? Because I'm thoroughly a scientist. And a biologist by trade, but you know, I just, it was amazing. I used some very powerful microscopes and I saw the intricacy of life. It is astounding. And there's no problem for me reconciling the two things the creator and the created order. Just looking at how cells work, I'm not going to bore you with the chemistry of it, but it's very complicated. And what's even more fascinating is the relationship between cellular things. The relationship, what fascinates me, is the relationship between us and, well, between us, between other animals, between us and plant, the plant kingdom, and also the physical world, the earth itself. All these are very, very powerful indicators 
of who God is. Historically, um, the church's doctrine <laughs> hasn't always helped over our relationship with creation. We do have a tendency as people uh, towards a more arrogant, egocentric view. Certainly historically, pre-Reformation, it was very, very felt that you know we were just the center of everything. It was um, not until some scientists, Copernicus and others, dis discovered that we actually lived we weren't the center of everything. That for our solar system, certainly the sun, and we rotate, we, we sort of went round to the sun. And but that if you look at the vast universe, and John was when he prayed before, this is the absolute miracle that we live in a world that's 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 created the, and, and and the universe which is beautiful and everlasting, and yet, and yet we can know this God, and that is absolutely. Mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. I remember talking to my dad <laughs> about this. <laughs> he said, James, there's no way I can accept God created things. I can't believe that he was interested in me. I can't. I said, that's, Dad, that's the miracle. Yes. The person that threw stars into space, we can know him and we can know him well through Christ. It's a, funny, it's a funny sort of position, uh, relationship we have because, uh, you know, where uh, the Bible says very much in the Psalms we're made a little lower than the angels. And yet it also says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Again, this is short of the miracle. But I just want to very quickly interject a little theological point. <laughs> I'm not a theologian. I want to share stories today. But... Have you asked yourself the question? We call Jesus Redeemer, and rightly so. But what did he redeem? What did Jesus redeem? In the evangelical tradition, there's been a tendency to focus not on our own salvation, really. I remember some months ago, I remember Amy sharing um, once that, you know, in her early Christian journey, it's very easy, especially in the kind of the first love of being a Christian, that you think it's wonderful and there's this great experience of Jesus and, and reconnection with God. And it's easy sometimes to get stuck in that and realize that that's not the only relationship God is concerned with. Because the whole of creation, uh, but in a redemption and uh, God's purpose for, for the earth and for us, is not just about us. Again, few words from Romans chapter 8. Paul grappling with this <laughs> deep theology. I remember singing in the 1980s when I was a bit younger um, a song about this, about God's purpose in redemption. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. I would say, friends, that God's purpose in redemption is redeeming the whole of creation. This is what it's about. We are there, part of it. Praise God. But there's a big picture. And so it begs the question, where do we fit into this? If God did create all things, and through the breath of his spirit, all things must reflect the creator. Must do by logic. All live, things live and breathe because God brought them to life. His fingerprints are there for us to see. When we see his mark, we can see his mark everywhere and the prints that he has left. It's like a great, if you've got a great cosmic forensic examiner and these scattered dust all over creation, <laughs> you would see God's fingerprints everywhere. And my, my key point in, in really in terms of relating to creation, we, we, we can see beyond 
the flowers we can see beyond even each other sometimes and we can meet God deeply out there in creation um, certainly during before COVID um, at Hanvelling where we live um, a friend and I and uh, what the family we hosted retreats I don't know what your understanding and notion of retreat is but the beach at Llandona lends itself to that really essentially spending a little bit of time out to listen and reflect and it's a great place to be able to do that and I think one of the things we, I remember doing actually one of the activities that we did uh, was to ask people to just go to the beach and just collect stuff and then find a quiet place and just touch smell a little bit feel it and just ask the simple question what is it saying to about God to you whether it's a razor clam a shell a bit of seaweed <laughs> a grain of sand because some of the theology we're going to have grains of sand was absolutely enormous <laughs> but <laughs> the kind of the timelessness of it all absolutely beautiful so the retreats have been wonderful to, to have there also, um, I'd like to tell you a little, uh, a little story about some of my own experiences, but also, um, first of all, about a long walk we went on through the countryside. But it wasn't in Wales, it was in Spain. I don't know if anyone's heard of the Camino de Santiago. Uh, Santiago is uh, in the northwest of Spain, and historically, uh, people have traveled right across Europe, including the British Isles, to go to Santiago, where the body of St. James, the Apostle of St. James the Greater, was meant to lay to rest. That's not why they go. And I think pilgrimage now has changed its tack slightly. In that, you know, you've got so many people on it now, uh, this pilgrimage route. Um, and people go on it for lots of different reasons. But we, uh, Leslie and I went on the, there's lots of routes in to Santiago, it's a bit like, Santiago is a bit like a hub, and you get loads of paths going into Santiago. We came in from the north, we flew to the north of Spain, and we walked from our Coruña in the north, uh, perhaps 15, mi 15 miles or so a day, and walked that walk through beautiful Spanish countryside. And again, I think part of the reason that we went was it was nothing kind of, oh gosh, what do we... We kind of really didn't think too much about what we expected on that journey. People do pilgrimage or long walks, whatever you want to call it, for different reasons. We went with a very open mind. But I remember going through the Spanish countryside and just kind of um, talking with various people. I think part of it was meeting some very, very interesting people from across Europe. And you realise that our humanity is very shared... And we met some people there, particularly who had been ostracized and rejected by their own church for different reasons. And they were very sad. And it was really lovely to walk that journey with them and, and listen to that particular story. But in that journey and, and listening um, to people and on that journey, we found that we could draw close to God. It's not the only place to draw close to God. I must say, qualifying this already... <laughs> <laughs> that's meeting God in the great outdoors and explain a little bit more what, what that might mean in a few moments but just there's nothing kind of magic in it, it it's a place and I and hope today we can, we can kind of open our eyes a little bit to the possibilities and I hope to do that in a, in a few minutes time but I want to um, I, I did a recording a recorded diary of the journey I'd like to play an extract <laughs> of that if I can get this mobile speaker to work. So, technology permitting. Um, yeah, so on the, on the Camino, the Camino, sorry, I should have said, the Camino, de San, Camino in Spanish just means way. And so there are several routes in Santiago. We were on the planet, what they call it the Camino Inglés. It's the English route. Nothing to do with, it's just because it was from the north, that was what it was. And um, so he, here is a, a, a little extract of a diary. And they're kind of shouting in the background are kids playing around. So if you wonder what's going, <laughs> going on, this is, a, this is me. And it's about coming across on the route, coming across a singing shepherd. 
We'll see what you make of it. Hi, uh, this is uh, day two on the Camino. We have arrived in Ponte Duome. Beautiful little old town, really, on the southern shores of the River Ume. It's been a, <clears throat> a good walk. Again, tired after a long day, but at peace. I need to relate a story of something that I saw actually yesterday. I remembered the singing shepherd. Often we talk about the metaphors and parables and ideas that Jesus had and how he compared life to different people in different places. Sometimes we feel the notions of things like shepherds or journeys are outmoded, but I would say not. Depends how you use the metaphor, but this, this, this old man was leaning against a stone hut on the edge of a field and he was singing loudly. He sounded very merry and I shouted across to him, Buenos dia, and saying hi and hola to him and he waved back. But then as we went round the corner past the hut, there were loads of sheep around the other side and we realised, so I realised, that the shepherd was singing for the sheep. Shepherds are not always there to guide and poke with sticks where the sheep should be or go. But perhaps the shepherd should, should just sing to the sheep. It lets the sheep know where the shepherd is. They feel safe, they recognise his voice. And it's an important part of the relationship between the shepherd who basically looked after the sheep and that was a very sort of powerful image really, singing to the sheep and uh, it was lovely to see. The sheep's reaction was, was, was fantastic. Could you put the next slide on please, sir, Dom? Just want to have a very brief look um, at some of the people's connections with God directly. In and about on the great outdoors, um, one of the most famous Psalms, of course, 23. And there's the first few verses. Can anyone guess why I've highlighted some of the words in white? <laughs> it's not a trick question. <laughs> so it's not. There's no theology in it. <laughs> yeah. They do with place. Very much to do with where it happens, not necessarily what happened or what David was thinking when he wrote this, but it's where it happened. David at the time, you know, was a shepherd, um, obviously the hills of Bethlehem. And you can imagine on the barren hills around Bethlehem and him writing this. But he wrote it, he wrote this, and we can write poetry and reflections based on our interaction with nature. And this is what David did. It's become one of the most famous of Psalms. So the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me loud lie down in green pastures. So you imagine David after a heavy day at work, <laughs> coming across an oasis. And he leads me beside still waters. He feels drawn to still waters. He knows that in that place, and you imagine coming across a stream and a mountain, a little pool, there's a, a great sense of peace, a great sense of calm. And that's what David realized, and he restores my soul. So David's out and about, he's not killing bears, <laughs> he's finished protecting his sheep, and he's just enjoying God. And that first phrase, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm, I'm a shepherd to these sheep but the Lord is my shepherd because I can see him working like I do out in the fields. He guides me in paths of righteous, righteousness for his name's sake. So, again, life like a journey on a path. And it's a path of righteousness. The, the, the path that we tread as Christians is the path of righteousness. He calls us down it and he walks with us in it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil. And why? Because you're with me. Even in the big valley, and if you've been through the mountains and you go into a deep valley, especially if the, the clouds are gathering, <laughs> it can seem a bit gloomy and a bit difficult to go through. But again, David used nature and his experience of it to articulate his understanding of God. He was there, walking through the valley, and even when life is in its darkest moment, I won't fear anything. And why? Because God is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. There are absolutely thousands of examples of, in certainly the Psalms, right throughout the Bible, of course, of course Jesus, much of Jesus' teaching was very much based in real life, the fields, <laughs> journeys. And so if Jesus uses those metaphors to help us engage with the God that we know, then perhaps we need to find ways of being a little bit more perhaps in tune with, uh, with what's going on. Oh, actually, next slide, please. <laughs> How's your Welsh? <laughs> um, <laughs> now, um, Welsh speakers would probably put me on. Like, I'm dusky coming. I'm learning to speak it. Um, <laughs> but I want to say a little bit about, again, uh, from my, my kind of love of history. Uh, if you look at that slide there, um, there's the word that you come across. If you're a visitor to the island, you've probably realised that the word chlan, the first top, the top left-hand word, is pretty universal. It's all over the place. And what does it actually mean? It's a prefix to a lot of words. There's a few examples there. So um, in modern Welsh, it probably means no more than church or parish or churchyard even. So if you look at those, the prefixes there, and you look at different place names, you have chlandona. Dwin Buen Clandona, that's where I live. <laughs> that's off. Because it's named after a guy. Donna was a guy, and his little church is right near our home, and it's where I think Phil and I have been there to visit it. And it's a place of real peace. And so Clandona is really um, the church associated with Donna. Or Dunna in original Welsh, it's, it was spelt D-W-N-A, Dunna more than Donna, but anyway. So place names to do with people. So the first one there and the fourth one down, Llanyestin. The second part of the word is a, a guy's name, Justin in English, Yestin in Cymraeg. So Llanyestin is another little church nearby and it's the little church of Yestin, Yestin's little church. So, but you have also um, place names that are to do with geographical features. So, Llangevny, where we are at the moment, it's the parish, if you like, around the river Kefni. The, the river runs through the, the town, I think. And you change the C to a G, mutate slightly. Llangevny. Llangoid, where my mother-in-law lives. God bless her. Um, she lives in Llangoid. And Coid is wood mutates to a G as well. So Llangoid is the parish in the woods. So it all makes sense. Llanbar Pool, I think, is Mary's Pool thing. It's Pool, Pool, isn't it? A pool. Yes, yes, anyway. Llanbar Pool, it's, it's Mary, you know, that very long word everyone likes to say. Llanbar Pool, I'm not going to say the whole thing, I don't know it. But it's also, that's a, very much a geographical feature. But, so in modern, in modern Welsh, that's really what it means. But in old, in, in his, historically, Llan does not mean that. Um, when I've been looking through the, the history books again, and I looked at the early, what you might call the Celtic period, I, in England it was called the Dark Ages, the 5th to 7th centuries. In Wales it wasn't called that. Does anyone know what it was called, that period, the 5th to 7th centuries? It was called the Dark Ages in England because no one wrote about it. So no one knew what was going on. <laughs> it wasn't very dark all the time. <laughs> the kind of so. Um, any idea? So uh, the word "schlan" originally uh, in, in Welsh, obviously, uh, meant 
a sacred enclosure. So as Christianity spread, uh, really, th th really uh, I think history has it that from South Wales right into the north, you had this system whereby uh, individuals mainly would come and preach. They would set up kind of areas, uh, in, uh, often outdoor crosses, where they would preach. And that's how the gospel was spread, through individuals. Uh, those little communities didn't really become more monastically based until later on in history. But that, I I in that period, um, uh, in, in Welsh history, it so wasn't called the Dark Ages, it, it was called the Age of the Saints. Not to do with saints as we know them, like St. Teresa or St. You know, um, Francis of Assisi, like the Roman Catholic Church would canonise someone. Any, any good Christian dude would be called a saint, which is lovely. I've got a lovely book at home. It profiles loads of early Christian pioneers in Wales. And that's really where... Um, in that period where Christianity really expanded. Um, originally, when, when they set up their little kind of uh, places of, of worship and uh, attracted people in, people used to go and listen to them preach. Now, I don't know when this happened, but eventually uh, they made, they enclosed the area slightly. So it wasn't just open with a, a big cross. You know, we c you've heard of the, the big standing crosses in mainly Ireland, but there were a few standing crosses in, in Wales, but not many. But in Ireland particularly, it was a meeting place. And what they, they began to do was to place rocks in a circle. And inside that bit was set aside for God. That was the sacred enclosure. And that's what Schlamm meant originally. So, I'm um, going back. The reason I've added little bits to it, because I've talked to Rachel about <laughs> this. Um, we were talking about connecting with God in nature. And... and what it means to s set aside a place for God. Now, we can meet God anywhere. Um, I, I've got a, just a few stories in a minute about where I've connected with God on the beach. But also, I is it worth considering, you know, um, when Christianity became more established, to actually have places where people could go, like we're gathering today? Um, and places where we can listen and just be very quiet before God and just kind of forget the noise and just kind of listen to a bit more. Not all the time, but just periodically. So I was talking to Rachel about this some months ago, and um, uh, we were talking about this issue. And um, the plural of Shlam has got an A, a U at the end. So we would say enclosures in Welsh, uh, like an I sound, Shlanai. So the Shlanai were little enclosures. Vach, I th I'm not sure the gender of Shlam, but small in Welsh is Bach. But I think it's a feminine noun, so you have to change it to the beat. <laughs> we thought it was Schlanvach. <laughs> so we, we were kind of praying and developing this idea a little bit of why, you know, how, how we create um, places, little enclosures, little, maybe not physical enclosures, but places where we could set aside for not just worship, but for listening and connecting and in a natural setting as close to the natural world as we could. That's ongoing. I've had some very interesting discussions with Phil about developing places where we can do this, and perhaps we'll, Phil will fill us in a bit more another time. So, what, <laughs> what about me in terms of meeting God in nature? Can we have the, uh, the next slide, Don, please? <laughs> There's a picture of our bay. Well, it's not our bay, but Tritlandona. And I don't know if you can s make out what it's, what's happening in the picture. But before I talk about that, <laughs> I was um, two significant things have happened to me in terms of guidance from God, and it's happened very much out in the outdoors. Again, it doesn't have to happen there, but I think for myself, for my own story, I would say that somehow being outdoors and being quiet y you can be more receptive there are fewer distractions more space for you to think and connect uh, two br very brief stories one was um, back in 2005 uh, Leslie and I have lived at Clandona for 12 years we, we moved in 2009 Rebuilt some of the family property uh, together with the, with the family, and uh, we've rented them as holiday lets. We live there now, but the holiday lets. Um, 
But prior to that, the, the, the journey there was really quite a long journey because we lived, I was a teacher in South Manchester and uh, the kids were at our two kids. I've got two kids <laughs> growing up now. Well, sort of growing up. <laughs> I'm not sure if you ever stopped being a, a parent really, but anyway. Um, I was on the... Uh, I'd offered for um, full-time ministry. Uh, I, I was a teacher at the time, but I was encouraged by my church to offer for full-time ministry, ordained ministry. And um, basically that didn't come to fruition. Um, had to go through a training program and stuff. But what happened was when, when that didn't kind of... Um, I'd given up um, headship of a school to help retrain... And I thought, you know, I, I believed I was, help, I was asking God to help the church to discern if this was the path for me. And I, and I uh, you know, having discussions with the church, at the time I think <laughs> the Methodist church, which I belonged, wanted administrators. Um, I always felt called to pastoral ministry, so I didn't kind of fit really in their system. <laughs> so anyway, so... Having given up, um, you know, my full-time career uh, as a as a head teacher at the time, I was walking the beach in 2005, just after the news about, well, that's not for you, James. <laughs> so I felt disillusioned and hurt and disorientated. I thought, God, what are you, God, what are you playing? <laughs> I've I've given this up, and I, I thought this is I thought this is the plan. But I was on the beach. There was no cloud the shape of Anglesey. There was no voice, <laughs> a deep reassurance. James, I want you here. And I don't know, there was no calling to set up a church. There was no calling to anything specific. Just listen to my voice. I'll make things clearer a little as they go along. Things still aren't totally clear. <laughs> But <laughs> the journey continues. So I was on the, I was on the beach, and um, th that's when I, I really sent a, a sense of calling. I shared this with Leslie and the family a little bit, and so you know the time time difference between that and two thousand and nine was preparation, making sure the the kids were in difficult times in their school school life. So we had to wait a little bit and make plans and talk to the family and stuff. So we had to kind of but. That sense of calling was the thing that triggered the move. And again, I think in terms of um, of, of ministry, I hate, <laughs> I feel uncomfortable with that word. There's only one ministry. It's the ministry of Christ. And we just experience it in different ways. It's, it's Jesus who the, does the ministering. So um, it's a discovery of, of what that ministry looked like for me. Where was I going? But over time, I uh, got involved a bit more locally with the church there and helped to lead worship and, and develop that as well. But that's another... But it was right to come. That's where it all began. And then, <laughs> about a year ago, I had a funny dream about the beach. And it's a rem remarkable story, really, because I got involved in a conservation project because the beach at Clandona is, is very beautiful. But since me uh, and um, my brother Steve and I, we've been there since, you know, as long as we can remember as, as holidays. And the sand dunes in the middle are, <laughs> are beautiful. Well, they were beautiful and they were pristine. So pristine that Steve fell down a hole and broke his leg. <laughs> you remember it, Steve. <laughs> We didn't break his leg, but he broke his cartilage. Anyway, we're having great fun. And we were on the beach, um, and the, the beach was stunning. And over the years, uh, traffic's got heavier and heavier. And there's been a problem with damage, a lot of damage. And ever since I've lived there, 2009, I've, I've taken it on a little bit to try and help protect it. But protection uh, of an area of outstanding natural beauty, which it is, isn't always straightforward. <laughs> You think conservationists, I'll be like David Attenborough, sort them all out. And I felt it was a bit of a calling for me to help protect the earth. As God would want us to, as stewards of the earth, to help protect it. And so that's why I embarked up upon a project talking with, with politicians and local authorities and the local council. 
And there was a real intransigence. There was a real reluctance to do anything about it from various people. And um, it got all very unpleasant last year. I uh, got caught in the crossfire of a lot of uh, kind of talk on Facebook and stuff that was I was just trying to protect and reestablish the beauty because the ecosystem, the habitat was getting absolutely wrecked. And some people accused me of, that's not what, you, what you're trying to do. You just want it for yourself. There are all sorts of funny arguments anyway. So I, ca I got very tired in this process <laughs> um, eventually. And it caused a lot of consternation at home. But one night I had a dream. Do you know the film The Snowman? I'm walking in the air. <laughs> the Snowman, a lovely thing, a uh, lovely uh, cartoon film about a, a little uh, snowman who befriends a little boy. And I had this dream, um, and oh, sorry, in, in, that, in that film, there's the snowman goes to a party in the North Pole with all the other snowmen, and he decides to bring the little boy with him. And the famous song, he tucks the little boy under his arm, and they fly, and that's where the song happens. I'm walking there. I'm walking in the dream that's got, uh, dream might sky, I can't remember now. But anyway, and they go together, and I had this dream that God was flying over the beach. <laughs> he wasn't in the shape of a snowman, don't worry. He was flying over the beach, and I was tucked under his arm, like the little boy. And I remember flying over the beach, and he turned to me and said, don't worry, James, anymore. You've done your bit. It's mine. It's mine. Let go. Sometimes when we're called to stuff, it's also important for us to let go sometimes. We can't change everything. Are people familiar with the prayer of serenity? There's a bit of that. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept things I can't change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I'd become unwise. <laughs> I need a realignment. But Rach came to see us after this. I had this dream and she was, she was lovely, very supportive about, about how we were feeling and about feeling a bit kind of alone uh, with, with the whole thing. And... Um, I told her about the dream. She came to Tlandona and I told her about the dream. And she said, that's amazing. Because someone has painted a picture of that dream. Totally independently. And she gave me this postcard, so I scanned it. <laughs> and that's what this person had a vision of and, and painted. And so it's become quite special. There's the Holy Spirit flying <laughs> over that beach and there's a time when we have to engage and a time we have to let go and I would value your continued prayers for a, a project that's still going on but I've, I've kind of withdrawn quite a bit from and I think we need to pray for healing in that community I think that the real problem there is is community or the breakdown of it it's not to do with conservation it's to do with community so I welcome your prayers for that community at Landona because there is a deep division in what's what's been going on so we can meet with God very deeply in the great outdoors we are in relationship with it our home is here in the cosmos we are part of what God has made and when we connect with it meaningfully we connect with God himself. And the last slide, please, Don. Can I just leave you with a few um, questions? I'm sure a lot of you here, especially in the summer days, um, love the outdoors. The talk I was originally going to give was going to be to interview someone as well about how they like the outdoors <laughs> and how much it meant to them. And, um, but I'm going to pose the questions, really, uh, for you to have a think about. No necessary re reaction today, but uh, no, I wonder what you, what you make of these questions because um, perhaps you can think about this personally. Now, if you forget them, if they could be made available, if you want to reflect on them again in your own homes or 
out walking, <laughs> then reflect on these. I would encourage you to reflect on these questions because they are very, very important as we engage. And you can change the we to I. Where do I meet with God? Where is my Klanbach? Where is your special place? I think mine definitely has become areas of the beach. Uh, again, there's nothing magical about it, but that's the place. I do m nearly all of my praying on the beach. <laughs> is that really praying? <laughs> Who knows? It's where I connect. Where is my still water? Where is my green pasture? There is one for all of us. I am absolutely convinced there is a place. How can we create, and this is a very important question, how can we create time to meet with God, particularly in nature? So I think there's a huge difference between going for a lovely walk on a summer's day. We, <laughs> we can't stop and look at everything and think, well, what is that telling me about God? But there is a time when we can set aside, where we do the walk, we swim in the sea, whatever we do, so I'm going to set aside this time to think how it, in, how it affects my faith. What is God saying to me in this? And a, an important question, as disciples, how do we discipline ourselves to listen? Um, I'm fond of my own voice too often. <laughs> I think we need to learn the art of listening and to listen to God. That's still small voice. Lastly, where do we fit in with creation? And what is our role in looking after it? If, we, if the creation is God's, which we know it is, and we see it being damaged, what do we do? Do we challenge? Do we ask people to pick up the letter? Do we say you can't park there? What do you do? It's a very difficult question to answer. Because with humanity, it all gets mixed up with motive, who owns the power? Who has the money? So it's not, not as straightforward as it looks. I'm sure David Attenborough's had his moments <laughs> of fighting. Um, it is a fight. You look at the planet now. You know, when Steve prayed before about, about you know, the wider issues in the Earth, you know, there's, there's a huge ecological issues facing. We know this. We know that. But if we see it happening locally, I can't do anything about the, the, the deforestation in the Amazon, not really. I can't fight for the orangutans in, you know, in Borneo because I, I'm not there. But when we see something here and on this one, what do we do? And I just would encourage you to pray, prayerfully look at those sorts of issues because uh, there's things that we can, we can work on together. God bless you and keep you. Do you want to join us? Do that song now, Al, or what, what, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do. Can I just end really by by playing a song? Uh, you may well know this. Be feel free to to um, take part in it. There's a funny story. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard it. A little child asked his mum, "Where's God?" <laughs> oh, he's everywhere. He's all around. He's absolutely everywhere. Do you mean he's in our, what do you mean? He's in our, all around the earth? Yes. Is he, yes. Is he, um, is he in our town? Oh, yes. He's, no, he's, yeah, he's definitely here. Do you mean on our street? <laughs> Mum's getting puzzled. Good, good theme. <laughs> so, sorry, don't worry. Um, in our very house. Well, I suppose he is. You mean he is standing next to us? Yes. Got him. Got him. But we can't contain God. <laughs> you can't contain God. How close is God? He's in the air that we breathe.